everyone, welcome. My name is Dana Ray Mandola. I'm the Vice President of Operations for the Disney Theatrical Group. I was also one of the members of the restoration team of this beautiful theater you see around you. Uh, welcome, 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 welcome to the new Amsterdam Theater. Before I uh, introduce um, our host for the season, I just want to tell you a little bit of a quick background of where you're sitting right now. Uh, you were here with me in 1996. Uh, you'd be under about two feet of water right now. Um, you, if you liked mushrooms, there was about 3,000 of them growing off the sides of these walls, some the size of dinner plates. Uh, the paintings you see above you had all deteriorated and were floating in the water, uh, crumpled up except for the gentleman with the sun above him. He was still there. The rest had deteriorated. The um, winged victory above you, there was about 30 pigeons roosting underneath that as well. It was really something out of Indiana Jones when we first came to the building. But with a labor of love, we were able to restore this building to the way it looked in 1921. And my job on that restoration team was to kind of put together little tiny nuts and bolts. What does the carpet look like? What do the ushers wear? This type of thing. Just find out more information we didn't have. And I went through ladies' journals of the day and diaries to find out about the information. And along the way, I started learning about the history of the Ziegfeld Follies and what happened on that stage, which I really had no idea about at all. And once I started digging deeper and deeper and deeper, it became an obsession with me about finding so much. And then people started coming out of the woodwork to speak to me and explain, yes, my grandmother, my grandfather, myself, I met the Ziegfeld girls, a 105-year-old girl, a 97-year-old girl, and I called them girls uh, because they were very much girls. And I'm not going to take up two, I'll give you one, one quick story. Uh, Dana uh, Eleanor O'Connell was 105 years old. Dana Eleanor was a Ziegfeld quality at this theater. And when you walked through the lobby when you first came in today, you saw glass panels above you, a relief. Tiffany painted glass. And one of those uh, girls, uh, we found out by etching on the back, we didn't know the glass was up there. It was spray painted beige when we got here. Um, we popped the panel and we saw that there was actual paintings of the woman there. One was named Dana Eleanor. And we found her through the Ziegfeld Club. And she, at the time, she was, she was one of the babies. Of she was 102. I invited her back in. Um, we were going to unveil it and have, a, have her there and be a wonderful photo op. I was new to the company. I didn't know how these things worked. I thought it would be a, a wonderful touching Disney moment. When we unveiled it, she shut up with a full mink stall dripping in diamonds. When we unveiled it, she looked up and she said, that's not me. My ass was never that fat. <laughs> <laughs> but it is your question. It's legal. That's when I started to realize what the Ziegfeld Follies were all about, what the entertainers were like. Um, when you're 105 years old, you still had that whip like that. So. Uh, it's, been a, it's been a real joy. And lo and behold, one day through our doors come the fields, the grandchildren of, of, of WC. And to come to see us and just show up and say, hey, here we are, it's like, oh my God. It, it was, it's like a time machine and some of the last piece of the puzzle coming together. Because of course, we all love W.C. Fields. Fields. He's festooned around the entire building from backstage to the front. And that's when I got to meet Dr. Harriet Fields, uh, who was W.C.'s only granddaughter of all the children. He had the only, his only granddaughter. She's the vice president of Fields Productions. She's a nurse educator and a healthcare proxy expert. She's an alumni um, consultant for the Teachers College of uh, uh, Columbia. And one of my favorite notifications is she's done work in Rwanda, where health work in Rwanda, where she's actually screened W.C. Fields' films, and they went over huge. <laughs> Which is really amazing to think that on the African continent, there's like, uh, even there, there's huge W.C. Fields fans <laughs> in Rwanda. So without further ado, I, I took up too much time already. I want to introduce Dr. Harry Fields. Dana, just a quick um, addition to the Rwanda story. Uh, Eric Cabera, who is the founder of the Kwaitu Film Institute, which is part of the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences International Outreach Program, and that's where we placed all our inherited artifacts and memorabilia from our grandfather, which is what Ron wrote his first book, W.C. Fields by Himself, at, at Prentice Hall's bestseller. But um, Eric Cabera said, 
that W.C.'s comic genius is unmatched in the world today. Now, he said this two years ago, and he also said he wants to teach his students, his film students, to do comedy so they in the country can laugh again. And then that was 18 years after the genocide, and that was 20. So W.C. feels influence. When you, what, you're, what you have a handout is the, the events we have planning only this year, and so there are more to come. And, um, and, and, that, and that's, that's part of when you say how W.C. feels it influences the world today, that's part of it. And he's influencing halfway around the world on another continent, and it's very, very gratifying and rewarding. And Belvin is not here, but I, just to follow up very, very briefly, W.C. Fields, my grandfather, is my spiritual inspiration. So whenever I'm in my spiritual home, New York, I don't go to church, I don't go to synagogue, mosque, temple. I come here to the lobby of the New Amsterdam Theater. <laughs> and I truly, and I hope I say this with composure, I stand in front of the photo of my grandfather and I say, thank you. Thank you for freeing me. Thank you for being you. And Belvin, I promoted him, Damon. I called him the, <laughs> the front door captain. How's that? Okay, that sounds fine. The lobby <laughs> captain. Dana, uh, Belvin has always let me in, even when the doors are locked. <laughs> and, and I do this several times a year, and I'm continuing to do, because it's my spiritual uplift. And he's always been kind. But each time I said, I know there's history of my grandfather in this building. Who do I talk with to get in past the lobby? And each year or each month that I would do this, he'd give me another name. And then finally, a year ago, January, Brother Ron <laughs> was here in, in town. And so I brought him to, sh to, sh to, see him, to show him the photo. And then Belvin said, I know who you should talk with, Dana Amendola, the Vice President for Operations. And here we are. And that's when we showed up. We called Dana from the lobby. So thank you very much. <laughs> Start with Ron and then Arthur and then Mr. Calvin. Brother Can I just say what I think your greatest accomplishment is? Uganda, is it? Rwanda. 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 If you ever go to Rwanda and wonder why people come up and grab your hand and say a hearty hand clasp. <laughs> <laughs> Brother Ronald J. Fields is an Emmy Award winner for W.C. Fields Straight Up, documentary award winner. He's also written best-selling books, W.C. Fields by himself, and it's going to be reissued early next year with a new forward by Conan O'Brien. Ron has also issued the essential filmography. Do you have that, Ron? W.C. Fields, A Life on Film. Yeah. And that's going to be reissued also in 2016, and we have new forwards by Ben Mankiewicz and David Robinson. And um, it's, it's, well, Ron is the world's field scholar. Everyone who does research on fields, they go to Ron's books first. Then we have Arthur Wertheim. Arthur has two new books out on fields, W.C. Fields. One oh, uh, was reissued this past December 14th on W.C.'s career up until, and it ends, May 15th, 1915, when W.C. Fields is entering the stage door of this theater on West 41st Street. Part two is also going to be reissued in 2016, and it starts with W.C. Fields in June 1915 and at the stage in this wonderful historic building. So Arthur, thank you very much for being here. And now. And now what to say. <laughs> Mr. Cabot, you, um, you're, an, you're an American treasure. And you're an American icon. I'll be the judge of it. Watch your marks. No, it's out of your control. It's the consensus of the public. Okay. So we thank you for that. Okay. But also, um, you're a truth teller. And to me, that's very rare in the world today. And it's what we, know, what we need. And W.C. Fields was a truth teller. Mm. And I think you and W.C. Fields, to me, are very, very much alike in the highest form of compliment. But both W.C. Fields and Mr. Cabot are cerebral comedians. You have to think in Fields' films or his work on stage whenever you see him. Or I always hear or see something different. And Mr. Cabot gives us that as his gift to us, to the public. 
and he does it today and continually, and he's done it in the past, and uh, I can't thank you enough. Um, you could try. <laughs> also, also coming out, you'll have lots of readings in 2016. I'm trying, how am I doing? Yeah, you're doing so great. So far, so good. Yeah, you're swell. In, in, 2000, in 2016, also being reissued is W.C. Fields' own Fields for President, which W.C. Fields wrote in 1940. We have the great honor and privilege to have a new forward by Mr. Dick Cavett. It's only 20 pages long. Yeah. <laughs> and now, to, to, before we start our program, Mr. Cap, I'm going to pose the first question to you. Uh-oh. And we, we had a lovely lunch in the late October, two months ago here in New York, and I went over the program with Mr. Cavett, but um, I wanted to ask you, you told us some lovely things. You told us that in 1964, you went to see our father, W.C. Fields, Jr., at the Gallery of Modern Art here at Columbus Circle. Mm. That was 50 years ago, our father. Uh, to me, it was very, very touching. But uh, I know, you know what you're so far alluding to. Yes. And I don't know the proper wording, but I know what you mean. I'm don't, yes. sorry to interrupt. No, our father was, it was uh, he was talking about his father. And actually, our mm -hmm. mother was there, too. And I thought, even as... You know, with that, even then you were a fan of W.C. Fields. And yep. you told me some other lovely stories, which I read in the New York when I was a graduate student at Columbia in the 1970s, that you would, on a Saturday afternoon, went to see Fields Films. And then after you sat on a bench in the park, and I'll let you finish that. And That's then, the part I, I don't know the exact wording. You have a better version of it than I have in my memory. But I went to the, in this case, the New Yorker Theater, I'm pretty sure, a revival house that sadly is gone. <clears throat> and... I saw two Fields movies in a row, um, and, and the, the Bank Dick, and um, I'm not certain what the other was, because I've seen them all so many times now, but it didn't matter. But I was moved by them, and that isn't the normal reaction for seeing a great comedian. And, oh. <laughs> Sorry, the no, no. I had the Lone Ranger as announcer. I mean, <laughs> that was very uh, buffy. <laughs> That's all right. They were tired of me. Um, but I, I was so moved by him. By moved, and I've never. We talked about this at lunch. I've never seen anybody write about this particular phenomenon. Seeing Fred Astaire, seeing a great gymnast perform. A great seeing Boryshnikov go into the air and seem to stay there for a moment and come down. You cry. Now, you're not sad, so why do you cry? Uh, it, it happens in great moments. And feel this greatness so overwhelmed me that uh, I'm getting moved now. <laughs> I sat in the park and thought, God, this man existed. His greatness is unsurpassed. Um, and I'm glad that he's still around, thank God for Phil. In fact, I'm going to suggest we all stay very late tonight in case a ghost would appear. <laughs> <laughs> because Woody Allen and I once out in Hollywood, he was working in a club and I was... Uh, <clears throat> no, he wasn't yet, he was still a writer. And I was a writer. And one day, Woody said, let's find W.C. Field's house. So we found it. On DeMille Drive. Right? Yes, yes. And there it was, this reddish, stonish looking house. And we just sort of sat there like people gazing at the Great Pyramid at Giza or something. <laughs> <laughs> and thought he existed and he lived there, and we fantasized that he might come out and invite us in for tea. <laughs> And I, I had added to this fantasy over the years. I thought his phone would ring, and he would say, uh, uh, I'm sitting here with a couple of Shakespeare's. <laughs> <laughs> and talk to us about comedy writing. Um, and we sadly agreed that we would probably never meet him, undoubtedly. <laughs> but uh, that fact that I sat in the park and was full of emotion about something I had just seen, which 
and you watch the movies on television, I'm sorry for people who meet the Marx Brothers for the first time in fields and so on television, they laugh, and it's funny, but didn't we agree that when you're in a revival house with a cult audience, <laughs> the roaring laughter at Mr. Muckle Honey uh, is just uh, overtakes you. I'll shut up now. <laughs> <laughs> and now his grandchildren, so many years later, are trying to make a buck off a of shade. <laughs> <laughs> I want to welcome Jack. Thank you so much for coming, and all of you for coming to this event. And as someone said, I hope he's, I, I just hope he's looking down, or in my case, looking up. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I brought some notes, and... Uh, for, because I couldn't remember the script, and that's what three martinis will do. <laughs> but anyway, a hundred years ago, a day, one day, W.C. appeared at the, at the stage here in the New Amsterdam Theater, and that was the first time he was a star on Broadway. But now, but how did he reach such a landmark in his career? It all started in January 29, 1880. Not there, but that's where we are now. It all started in 1880 in a little burb outside of Philadelphia called Darby, where William Claude Dukenfield was born. He came into this world with three distinct and eight talents, a sense of humor, incredible hand-eye coordination, and a stubborn determination, not known until many years later, of course. <laughs> Just about the time he learned to walk, his parents put him to work hawking fruits and vegetables with his father down the cobblestone streets of Philadelphia. He realized early that he had an act for juggling. He would practice with his father's fruits and vegetables as props. Unfortunately, his father did not appreciate his son's talent. <laughs> Before he hit his teen teenage years, he got a job in a pool hall, where he then started juggling pool balls, <laughs> much to the happiness of his father. Uh, and entertaining people with the sharp study of the idios idiosyncrasies of the patrons as they tried to line up their shots. By then, he jealously eyed vaudeville as a life's goal, but he, he, he could not lug a pool table in vaudeville circuit, so he just concentrated on juggling primi primarily. At the age of 18, he finally got a break, got a call from Fontescue Spear in Atlantic City, New Jersey. So he headed out there. And that's where W.C. Fields was born. How's that? <laughs> well, he billed himself William Claude Dukenfield, juggler extraordinaire. Well, that wouldn't fit on that billboard or any billboard. <laughs> so the manager kept cutting it down with W.C. Finally, they came up with W.C. Field, juggler. And everyone, he said, W.C. says, everyone else put on the S. So he finally caved in, and it was W.C. Fields, and that's how the name came about. Uh, it was in the Atlantic City where he met Hattie Hughes. It's his future wife and our grandmother. And he fell in love, 18 years old. I j just think that, you know, and, and every day until he died, they were in contact, even though it was vitriolic mostly, but they were in contact once a week. <laughs> And uh, that's where he met Hattie Hughes. And, and um, at, at Atlantic City, he, he, he considered himself a serious juggler. But at Atlantic City, he would miss the, the balls juggling. And his anger at missing the balls got everyone howling. <laughs> and so he put in fake misses. Just as, and so, ergo, he became a comic juggler. And so it was in short order, he caught the eye of vaudeville scouts. By the time he turned 20, he signed with the most pre prestigious vaudeville company in the world. That was the Keith Orpheum uh, circuit. And he quickly garnered the billing world's greatest comic juggler. Now, there were a lot of comic jugglers, actually, at that period of time. Not, not a lot. It was probably six or seven. <laughs> 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 But uh, he was considered the world's greatest of those. <laughs> <laughs> he added Hattie to his act, and they got married in 1900 in San Francisco. They left from New York. They crossed the country in the Keith Orpheum. 
They stopped in San Francisco before they took the boat down to Australia and South Africa and then back up to Europe, and they got married in San Francisco while they were on the tour. Um, later, he brought his juggling routine here in, in 1915 to this very theater, the New York Amsterdam, exactly 100 years ago and a day. For his very first starring role on Broadway, we have no kinescope or anything like that, incredible and an hilarious juggling turn, as the cr critics called it, but we can't peek at a shadow of what he did. Years later, in his act, uh, in 1934, motion picture, The Old Fashioned Way. <laughs>
you probably saw in there so quickly what's been called the hardest juggling feat ever mastered. And it's not the boxes, it's not the balls, as we know, but that kicking, try balancing a stick on your toe, that's enough, and then flipping it and catching it. It said he worked on that for six to eight hours a day until he went, fell forward on the bed in a daze, <clears throat> but finally, obviously, perfected it. And it goes by like that. <laughs> Well, you can go on, and I don't have to ask you the question. Oh, okay. <laughs> but I, in your forward, your in, uh, profound forward to Fields for President, yeah. you say you started off that, uh, an intriguing question, and the question is: Is it possible to be uh, funnier than W. C. Fields? But you start off he, he combined, is combining phenomenon of talent, aesthetics, and I think this is in the case yeah. performing art psychology, and maybe even philosophy. And, it, I and the question, is it possible to be funnier than W.C. Field? That's what you had posed. And yeah. seeing this, but I thought, do you do into magic somewhat? Are, are you not, or did, do, are you? Well, I don't want to brag. <laughs> <laughs> I was, as you undoubtedly know in your wide reading, uh, state no, champion <laughs> gymnastics pommel horse in Nebraska, and last year I found my gold medal. Oh. Anyway, yes. Uh, also, as you might have been going to say, but you're too much of a lady, that at the beginning of my, that essay I said uh, something like, if Bartlett's has a section for the dumbest things ever said, um, this might be the top of the list. There was a lady columnist years ago, and there's, and she committed this ignorant blot. It wasn't that bad, of course. Uh, I, there's, there's reason to think relatives who might be here tonight, so I'll just say that her initials were Dorothy Kilgallen. <laughs> and um, the one who was caught poking a hole in her mask on what's my line, so she always guessed it. <laughs> And because of her odd chin, Jack Parr, in his tasteful manner, once called her the Andy Gump of What's My Line. Anyway, <laughs> she wrote with her column, in her column, and I saw it with my own eyes. Everybody tells me how funny W.C. Fields is. Well, I ran two of his movies. He is not funny. <laughs> I hope they drove the steak in. <laughs> <laughs> <That's all. laughs> um, in a sense, I felt that I met him. Well, that sounds spooky. Maybe we didn't talk about this. Yeah, it's in the introduction. Uh, I was working at, I had an office at Paramount, working with Jerry Lewis, and he said, did you ever meet my friend Paul Jones? And I said, it's a familiar name. Uh, Paul M. Jones, you've seen it at the beginning of Fields Movies, it's producer. And he took me down a hall and he left me with this charming old gent, Paul M. Jones, delightful, lovely man. And at a, one point, he, he may have been your granddad's best friend, or one of, certainly one of them. Hmm. He said, Bill used to come over to my house and we'd sit on the porch and rock. And he would tell fantastic tales that he'd concoct about his travels, uh, seducing Maharaja's daughters in India, and so on and so on, the, the kind of thing that we know of. And that he also wrote him letters when he was traveling the world. He sent his friend Paul Jones single-spaced type three-page letters of these hilarious monologues. And I said, where are those? And he said, I put them all in a shoebox, uh, and they were in my garage, and my wife cleaned out the garage. Oh. Uh, I hope celestial justice uh, to <laughs> that she fries in hell. <laughs> I didn't put that in the piece, because it's not nice. But, uh, I think I said, um, correct me, if it were a choice of being able to save those letters and bring them back, or the contents of the library at Alexandria. 
would be a difficult choice. No, it wouldn't. <laughs> well, uh, he imitated your grandfather. He said Bill would sit here and he'd see Adolf Zucker down at the end of the hall. And he would talk to him and me simultaneously. You know what I mean? Out of this side of the mouth. Hey, Adolf, yeah, little bastard of a pecker. <laughs> little bastard with a baby's pecker on you. You know, you're looking great, Adolf. You're a great man. <laughs> and Paul Jones became. He looked in the, he looked in the corner, he had it all, it was wonderful. Uh, came back to New York, the Jerry Lewis show folded by popular demand. And um, a month later, a letter just to my new friend, and it contained the only surviving W.C. Fields letter. I meant to bring it here, it's brief. Um, he's angry in it. He encloses the letter that made him angry, saying, Dear Bill, we were driving past your house the other day and we saw a nose rocking in a rocking chair on the porch. <laughs> <laughs> and closer inspection, it proved to be you. You looked awful, you looked like you were about to leave us. And he enclosed about 20 brochures from mortuaries. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll get you the name when I find it again, it's in the country. But he said, I suspect that son of a bitch, Jack Anderson, perhaps some such name. And then at the end, anyway, so long for now, Willie. And he drew his own face with a nose <laughs> and added a hearty hand clasp. <laughs> I own this. <laughs> <laughs> First bid. <laughs> Boy. What a man. That he was sad so much is awful. You know, comics have wretched lives often. They have two traits. They have wretched lives. They spend half of it committing sexual atrocities and drinking themselves to death, uh, and have wonderful wives. Mm -hmm. I was working on the Tonight Show, some writers that got together, they'd worked with all the comics you saw in Ed Sullivan. They said, the thing they have in common, they all have these great, wonderful, long-suffering wives <laughs> <laughs> that they don't deserve. <laughs> uh, and it, it is odd that those who, in a kind of obit piece I wrote about Robin Williams, I said that he came off one night in the village <clears throat> early on and the audience was still applauding and I said, you better go out and take another bow. And before he did, he said, isn't it funny that I can make these people so happy and not myself? Um, and now we know how that worked out. Um, but I interrupted you. Oh, well, I think our, we're going to segue into another, um, another of Fields films and I think Arthur will. You can just show the juggling thing four more times. <laughs> that is profound. That is profound. No, you don't want to do that. Because we have pool. Oh, by the way, Arthur, up. excuse me, the ball bounces off the forehead of? Tammy. Oh, Fields. Tammy. Yes, thank you. Tammy. Um, yeah. Oh, Tammy. Yeah. Well, he's, he's, anyway, uh, my job is to do the uh, next routine, which is the uh, pool play. And as uh, Ron said, he, he was had a job as a kid uh, in a pool hall in Philadelphia, and I don't know, Philadelphia is a big pool <coughs> town. Lee Moscone, for example, came from Philadelphia, so he would watch all these people, uh, particularly the, the gamblers and the sharks, take, take on uh, a lot of people and, and win money. He's very impressed that he'd do that someday, which he did because he had a pool table in every one of his houses, and he would invite friends or non-friends and, and really win a lot of money. And he loved sleeping on a, the pool table as he grew older, because of his back. It was the one place, you know, he felt comfortable sleeping on. And uh, someone discovered that and asked him why, because it just felt good. It reminded him of the green felt. He loved the green felt. Anyway. Uh, this is a shot in 1908 at the London Coliseum. First of all, you see the, the, the cigar boxes again. 
Uh, but this is a vaudeville shot that he's doing at a very deluxe theater in London. And he's uh, the headliner here. And he usually was, he was very popular in England. And he usually was the uh, headliner unless there was a British music hall celebrity. And if there was, he'd be pushed down to number two because the British wanted to see their their celebrity. But he also found out that the British really worshipped their vaudeville people. Uh, Dan Vino had a one of the great music hall personalities. His, his funeral lasted long, long lines to see his hearse go by. And, and it, I don't know if an <laughs> American vaudeville uh, person would have such a, uh, you know, a funeral like that. Well, anyway, uh, he's dressed in a very, he looks like, he's very shabby, like he's kind of an, trying to be aristocrat, but he's lost a lot of money. It's a tattered coat he's wearing and that disheveled uh, top hat. He's got a false beard and a false mustache. Those were all with, uh, on him, and he kept a false mustache for years, clip on one. And he's got special shoes, you know, very flat. Anyway, the first time he did this was around 1903 in England, but mo then he went to, back to the United States and really did it all the time, and it became very, very popular. 1904, and that's the time... Uh, Ron and Harriet's father uh, was born. Um, and then he uh, kept doing that on, on the road. So eventually uh, he decided, well, when he went to uh, his first time at the Follies here in 1915, a year ago, a month, century ago, and he, he did a pool act in a cabaret scene with Edwin, and Edwin would kind of fool, he'd fool around and try and upstage him. He'd be at the bottom of the, of the pool table, making funny faces and at the audience. And eventually, uh, this is a story uh, that uh, Fields got so angry, he just maybe clubbed him with a cue. <laughs> carry it off. Other things is they got a fight in the backstage. But that's and but actually they, they, they said, hey that was funny, everybody laughed. So they kind of continued it continued it on. The very first film. <laughs> words about the pool sharks was that it's not a very authentic uh, pool scene that, that's done there. There's a lot of trick photography and, and it's actually more slapstick and Fields was not really a slapstick comedian at all and so don't see it as it's, it's a great film because it's his first film that's one of two films, silent films he did in 1915. The other one's lost, unfortunately. <laughs> and uh, so, but he didn't have a good feeling about film. So he never did another one for about 10 years. That's, that's a long time. 1915 to 1925. So uh, there's some reason besides I had a mixed reaction to, to movies. Uh, Ziegfeld didn't want him in the movies. He didn't want Fields to do his act, and people wouldn't come in to see the Follies. So he, he, he only in this movie, you, if you see it all, there's, Ziegfeld is giving him permission. And after that, no more. And so he didn't do really a, a movie for a long time. Now. 
this is one of uh, the one you saw was he did do about nine or ten silence films. Uh, half of them, unfortunately, are lost. So it's very hard to to um, analyze, you know, it, how great a star he was in silence. But I happen to like the silence. <laughs> there are really some of them that are really good. Um, and um, now this is 20 years later. In, in 20 years later than uh, almost than the Pooh Sharks, and this is called Six of a Kind. Tammy, Tammy Young is his foil and his uh, uh, straight man, as they say. And notice how much better and how more authentic his pool scene is here. And, and it's a much better example of, of his pool playing. With all this, with all the action that's going on, it's interesting. If you listen to the story, it probably lasts 25 seconds. Why the, why the scene lasts for minutes? Uh, but it's a, and the story itself is funny, but it's easy to miss because of all this, uh, with right. all the things. Harriet wants to point out something. Well, but that actual pool table, and you'll notice from Six of a Kind, and also the last film, one of the last films of W. C. Fields, actually hitting the, the the ball into the pockets, whatever you call it, in pool. We we have we inherited that pool table. And now it's on loan uh, from the W.C. Fields family at the Magic Castle in Holly, which, uh, which I think you might have seen a, a few months ago, Mr. Cowell. Uh, very, very precious. <laughs> and uh, September 19th of this year, which is exactly, it's a Saturday, exactly 100 years, we'll have a ceremony, a program in honoring that, the pool table, and also showing this. And Brother Alan and Ron will be hosting that with the Magic Castle. So those of you who are out mm -hmm. there, um, it's in your program, and you'll, you'll know how to get in touch with us through our website, wcfields.com. So let's go see that, the talking version, Six of a Kind. Thank you, Eric. Crooked, isn't it? Like see something in this joint that isn't crooked. No tip on it. There's one. Tell me, Sheriff, how did you ever get the name of Honest John? The time of which I speak, I'm tending bar up at Medicine Hat. Well, a guy used to come in there with a glass eye. <laughs> <laughs> I used to wait on him. Let's take this glass eye out, put it in a tumbler of water, let it break these balls. <laughs> the glass eye. Thank <laughs> you. 
tell me. How did they come to call you Honest John? <laughs> One day he forgot his glass eye. I found it. The next morning when he came in, I said, young man, here's your glass eye. And I gave it back to him. That was since that time. <laughs> I've been known as Honest John. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he actually, one of his very last films was called Follow the Boys, and W.C. took the role so he could do his pool routine for the last time. So the pool routine that started right here, that started way back in 1903, and I said 1904, and he's the new foremost historian of WC. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and uh, played here uh, was actually one of his last scenes in a film called Follow the Boys. Fields was doing it for the American troops. It was a thing during World War II to entertain the troops. And here's that scene. By the way, it's the same pool tape. <laughs> Come on! Make up your mind! <laughs> he had a mechanism underneath for strings to each balls that brought the balls to their proper pockets. God, I've lost four pounds laughing. <laughs> One of the phenomena you mentioned at the beginning of the lovely forward <clears throat> to Fields for President um, that, that wasn't mentioned, but it's really storytelling as well. And what yeah. I love about these three shots is the, the pool sharks was very, very brief, but the first film, Six of a Kind, which is a classic and really absurd, Honest John, but he never hits the ball. He, he, he destroys the table. <laughs> and then finally, at the very end of his life and his career, he hits the ball. So that's, it's really a nice a story arc, isn't it? Of, of success, yeah, really, yeah. an accomplishment. But storytelling, and you are also a master storyteller. How do you relate that comedy and storytelling added to all the other phenomena of, um, that you mentioned in the, the lovely forward art? Aesthetics, art, performing art, yeah. philosophy, psychology? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How closely do you see storytelling to comedy? I know what you mean, but I don't know if, if I have the kind of mind that can analyze that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> you love the fact that there, there's a plot to the thing, like a good story. You know, somehow they're gonna, there's going to be an ending that's appropriate. And I... There's something about him that's never been finally, fully defined. John Cleese called him the greatest comedian ever. Um, Dick Schickel in his short about comedy to sheer genius. Uh, greatest comedian, comic talent since Mark Twain, mm. storyteller there. Um, it's just uh, <coughs> hard to, you can never say what it is. What makes Fred Astaire dancing the same step as a line of 22 excellent dancers behind him? <coughs> and you can't take your eye off him and look at any of them for a second. It, it, it's the je ne sais quoi, if you will pardon the expression. Um, my manager, who died this couple days ago, the great Drac Rollins, <clears throat> man who discovered Harry Belafonte and Nichols and May and Woody Allen, you've heard of, and others. Um, and one night I, I asked him, Jack, what is it about the great ones? And it came up because a B comic, <laughs> a comic who never made it, was complaining at a table of us at the stage. What's it there? Why come I don't get up there with Jack Benny and George Burns and Groucho Marx? And I, what the hell? I get laughs. I kill the audience. And, and he left. And I said, "What is it, Jack? How would you ever explain it to him?" And he said, "You can't." Jack had a real brilliant mind. There's a certain largeness missing in the lower level ones. He didn't mean size. He didn't mean loudness. He didn't mean large like 
the great Rodney Dangerfield, uh, but a, a, a largeness that's, I suppose, the largeness that's in a Rembrandt painting, but not in uh, a Walter Keene. Um, anyone want to dispute that, Hans? <laughs> Ooh, those eyes. Um, by the way, I interviewed Walter Keene when I was working for Jack Parr before I became a writer. I booked people, and I tried to keep him off the show, but... Uh, <laughs> he flounced into my office and plopped down a $15,000 check and said, I just got that from the United Nations for my Children of All Nations painting. And here were these ghastly children with their saucer eyes. And I said, have you ever thought of making a deal with the Marine Company? <laughs> so, I, I tell that here only because I think Bill Fields would have enjoyed it. <laughs> but anyway, the, 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 that, that largeness that's missing... Um, in the comics who wonder what's so hot about fields that I don't have maybe, I don't know uh, Johnny Ed McMahon many others if those their appearance are reviewed over the years how often they just drop into his voice without explaining yeah. it, without mentioning him and everybody except the current ignorant young <laughs> don't care to know anything that preceded their birth <laughs> and shocked me this year in two instances asking A, who were the Marx Brothers and B, who was Johnny Carson oh, no. so Tempest does fugit uh, Woody Allen's at once when we, we were talking about fields and, uh, and then we stopped and took a walk in the park and some dumb dame came up and said, uh, Hey, Woody, do you ever make a list of your pet peeves? <laughs> and a shot rang out. <laughs> uh, your pet peeves. And I wasn't looking, I was just listening, and I, Woody said, No, my dear, I never did. <laughs> I never forget it. <laughs> Did I slide off your question? No, I think that's beautiful. I think that's beautiful. Oh, here's something. This may be unique, or as the ignorant young say, very unique. Uh, <laughs> you'd, you'd like the time a guy on my show said, can I share a story with you? And I said, no, tell us all of it. <laughs> I may have said give us all, but anyway. Uh, old, uh, uh, the, the, the old gent that I referred to er, earlier, Paul M. Jones, said, uh, did you know something about Bill? And I said, I hope it's something new. And he said, I think it is. Did you know that he cut the heels off his shoes? And I said, you know, when or for what? He said, no, he, 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 oh, he removed the heel. It, it, Helped him retain on stage that walk that with our ballet slippers in, in the certain scenes. Uh, it, it, it had something to do with the fields walk. It, was that news to you? Is it news to well, the bit's news to me. But cutting the heels off his shoes. I, yeah, the I, I, I've shoes. heard. Yeah, I've heard that before. For, yeah, interesting. Not hilarious, but it, <laughs> you know what? He was very, very athletic, and you can see that in the juggling. Oh, he moves like very, a very dancer. light on his feet. Isn't that funny? Because that famous remark when he saw Chaplin for the first time, nothing but it. And he walked out and said, "Son of a bitch is a ballet dancer." <laughs> you you have that in your forward, I think. Do I? Someone who would call um, that W.C. was the greatest comic. And Cap Chaplin was the greatest. Oh, who? Somebody said that. Yes, uh, I think it might have been. It wasn't Graham Greene who, mad about Fields, and said this is the rare, one of the rare times where true genius is the right term. Um, yeah, what was it again? And then uh, it might have been Chaplin was a performer, but yeah, he was oh, the greatest, greatest cl ver uh, Chaplin, Fields is the gr our greatest comedian, Chaplin our greatest clown. Yes, there you go. And now we've added to the clown list Donald Trump. Yeah. <laughs>
He's been there for a long time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. He's been there a long time. He'll be emeritus. Anyway. The Gospel Says became a very important film in W.C.'s life. He did the routine first on stage here, and all his stage, where the theme of the show is the stage step goes on the film. He made his first talk. This is a photo of W.C. on stage. And that's Shorty Blanche, which was another stooge. W.C. loved having stooges like Tammany Young and Shorty Blanche. And they were never actors. They were just people he happened to meet. <laughs> and he'd use them in his films. Um, he, from stage, he made his first talking motion picture. Uh, oh, it, it, the Silence was His Lordship's Dilemma, which came out in October of 1915. And that was a golf, that was a golf routine in that. And then he made the very first talking film over in New Jersey, Ideal Studios, am I correct? The Astoria Studios. And I think he, this was over in uh, Hudson Heights, New Jersey. Yeah, this is the uh, uh, Astoria was Fool Sharks. Yeah. And um, His Lordship's Dilemma. And this is, uh, this is the scene from stage. Now, the, inter the only interesting thing, and I'll cut this down, was that the, act, the director chose to shoot not a scene remade for movies, but W.C. actually on the stage doing the routine. So it's, I think it's very interesting for that reason, and it's a funny routine. It's a 1918 uh, photograph. 1918, Follies. okay, yeah. From the Broadway. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, there are two ladies in there, they were always part of this act. Yes. Both of them are kind of Zigfield girls. The one in the center, a very tragic career that she had a weight problem. And I'm just showing this because all these beautiful ladies, some of them made very good film stars eventually. The showgirls, the Zigfield girls also were included in, in the acts, which I find very interesting. So let's see the, the golf specialists. I just love it out here. So nice and green and yes, everything. Yes, it is. Rather parky this morning, though. I have never been off to car and golf course in all my life. Little sissy, did you bring a ball with you? Wonderful. Now stay in clear and keep your eye on the ball. Everything is falling. This is what they call the explosion shot from the tee. <laughs> Thank you, boy. Wrong club. <laughs> what? Wrong club. I did putting niblick. A putting niblick? <laughs> really, the little chap doesn't understand the nomenclature of the game. Now stand clear, boy, and keep your eye on the ball. <laughs> I have it. It's all right, Stan. Stay. <laughs> all right, come here. Stand back here. He gets all hot and bothered about nothing. I lost the money to a friend of the canary. I am coming to the club like this in the back. I lost the money to a friend in the Canary Islands 20 years ago. How dreadful. Chap the name of Pumphrey Total Whistle. Oh, what a funny name. Uh, it's one of the Total Whistles from Twickingham. If you've ever been to Twickingham, <laughs> oh, quite a driver. Yes, she is. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, we lost all the both of us in the Canary Islands. He was kicked to death. Oh, that's a shame. Uh, he was kicked to death by two infuriated canary birds. Oh, what is it? Someone has been feeding them meat. I have to... Anything <laughs> strange about that glass? Yes, it does look rather odd. Yeah. I think the shaft is warped. Give me another pack. Ah, that's better. Yeah. That's much better. Yeah. Now, stay here, boy. Keep your eye on the hall. This is what they call hitting past the chin, as I told you before. Really remarkable stuff.
Crafty after all. A pie. Have you been a pie or golf course? A pint, yes. But a pie, never. Why, it's like, uh, it's like carrying, carrying, uh, something or other, somewhere or other, as the case may be. You stand clear and keep your eye on this ball. Stand clear, boy, keep your eye on the ball. Stand clear. Quite a breeze. Yes, it is quite a breeze. Yes, yes it is. Quite a breeze. Yeah. Here's your overcoat. <laughs> now stay clear, boy, and keep your eye on the ball. Now you're saying this is hitting past the chin? Yeah. Hitting as far past the chin as possible. Mm -hmm. Then never stand close to the ball when you hit it up your head. Now it's like one of those birds that fly backwards. Oh. Hey, Claire, boy, keep your eye on the ball. It's coming this way. feet of yours. I was saying, it requires a great deal of quiet nerve. <laughs> Stand still and keep your eye on the ball. I'm sorry to get loose like that, but... Uh, what is it? Oh, God for Daniel. <laughs> or chop suey or whatever it is they have there, so much else. <laughs> I said I'd like to wring your neck. I'd like to wash it first and then give it a good one. <laughs> give it a ring that heal for miles. Miles. <laughs> you take that out, please. Well, yeah. Thank you. Put it in there. It's really disgusting. Oh, it's terrible. I'm sorry that you had to see this. <laughs> now, stand here and keep your eye on the ball. Hello, 
Sheriff. Oh, I am. The Sheriff is looking for Mr. Bellwether. Ooh. <laughs> well, where is he? He's out playing golf with your wife. With my wife? Come on, holy smoke, let's get it. There it is. Huh? There. Where? On the end of your club. Oh. So it oh, is, so it is. Yes. What an eye he has. Mm. Hey, you stand clear and keep your eye on the ball. Oh, I've forgotten something. Huh? Oh. Probably forgotten her horse. <laughs> well, I won't need it anyway. Won't need a horse. Want to ride it? I won't need it either. Here's a club for you for short holes. <laughs> now stand clear, keep the eye on the ball. I lost a horse one time. I forgot him. I left him down the Grand Canyon. Grand Canyon. That's a beautiful camel you have with you. <laughs> Crazy about me. Now stand clear, boy. He don't stand there. Don't you know I'll smite you in the sconce with this truncheon? <laughs> He's standing right and go boom away. <laughs> I'll have to have it reblocked. Oh, that's <laughs> I was saying this is hitting past the chin. Stand clear, bar. tell you was. Keep the wrists together. Never let the wrists separate. Take the club back slow. Not only did W.C. Fields perfect that, his pool routine right here in this, in this historic building, the New Amsterdam Theater on stage, but if you want to see the uh, silent version that includes the golf, uh, the golf routine, and so is your old man, as well as the talking you're telling me, on early October, it will, and just look, our website will have the exact date, they will be screened at the Museum of the Moving Image. And across the street from the Astoria Studios, uh, uh, now Astoria Studios, um, they'll also be uh, in the original commissary, which is a beautiful restaurant, the, uh, the Astor Room, we'll have a reception after. And the museum, the moving image, is going to throw in everyone, quote unquote, arguably everyone's favorite, it's a gift. So be sure, this will be probably this uh, first Saturday in October. So you'll see the complete package of W.C. Fields uh, golf routines. And we're moving into, um, the Max Senate, Aaron, and our Arthur has 30 seconds to tell us to introduce the <laughs> introduce and a half this seconds film. Of fame. 30 seconds, Arthur, we're well, timing you. <laughs> well, this is uh, 1930, so he, he meets Max Senate again. There you go. And he does four films with him, which really helped his career. And this is the first, it's The Dentist. Sit <laughs> down. Can you open your mouth? Uh, come on now, you got a bigger mouth than that opener. <laughs> mm. Oh, beautiful. Mm. 
Hand me that uh, 404 circular buzzsaw, will you? <laughs> dropping, 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 dropping. Is that a 404 conical you give me? Ah, heaven's pennies before? No! This won't hurt you much. I can't find his mouth. <laughs> Hand me that stethoscope, will you? Thanks. Will you say ah, oh, please? Ah. Oh. Again? Ah. Oh. Again? Ah. Oh. 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 Thank you. Now, just open your mouth. This can't hurt. Okay. <laughs> can't say that hurt you. about this scene. Uh, W.C. Fields performed this in Earl Carroll's Vanities just up the street. And at the time, they, they, the Humane Society supervised all of us. They used five or six canaries, and they trained canaries. And the canary would fly out of the beard and then land on the floor, and W.C. Fields would scoop it up and put it in his pocket. But the police, uh, the Humane Society police, I think there was friction between the Humane Society trainers and the police. They, on stage, handcuffed W.C. Fields and accused him of torturing a canary. And they put him in jail overnight. And in the whole process, the press was there. And then, then they accused W.C. Fields of, of murdering a canary. But, uh, it, so anyway, the, the W.C. Fields was handcuffed, put in jail overnight, and not instead of waiting several months, he had his trial the next day at the Midtown Community Court, which is at 314 West 54th Street. And uh, there was a trial. The uh, W.C. Fields performed his duty as a citizen, told the truth. And at the end, the judge was furious. He dismissed the case 
uh, and accused the, uh, the police of, of trumping up the, the whole story and uh, of not being truthful, lying. Really, really quickly, the, the photographers came, I mean, the police came yes. out with a live canary in a cage, and yes. all the photographers were taking photographs of them with that flash powder. Exactly. And yeah. what killed the canary was a flash powder. Yes. <laughs> so the canary was asphyxiated. He didn't fall to the ground, he was asphyxiated. Um, Two years ago now, the court, Judge Felicia Menon, the chief judge of that court, contacted us. They wanted to do, uh, have a tribute to this trial because the New York Times in September 2012 had an article about it. So Dr. Uh, Judge Menon and her court uh, attorney, Alan Mass, they're also w huge W.C. Fields uh, fans, but it was a beautiful portrait and the, there was a link to the trial, a portrait of really justice. So now, it was last July 24th, uh, there is now a permanent display to Justice versus W.C. Fields, and it, pray, it gives the history of the trial, a photo of W.C. Fields, the live canary, the dead canary, and a link to the trial. And that now is in the Midtown Community Court of 13, 314 West 54th Street, in, in the lobby, and on December 21st, also in your list of, of events to come and to take away, please come to the uh, Midtown Community Court. We're having a reading of the Canary Trial in the actual courtroom, <laughs> in the actual courtroom which is now an off-off-Broadway theater of the American Theater of Actors. And we have the founder and director of the American Theater of, of Actors here, Jim Jennings. So please join us. <laughs> Hi right, guys, I have a few things to say, but I'm going to cut it down to, let's take a look at the another, broad, another product of Broadway, which is a routine he did here. Um, and it's called A Pharmacist, which was part of the Max Senate show. Yeah. How's it doing? How do you do? Is there a lady in attendance here? Huh? Is there a lady in attendance here? Oh, oh, yes, yes. Yes, 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 I'll be right down. Be right down. Thanks. She'll be right down now. Coming now. What can I do for you? Is there a ladies' restroom here? <laughs> yes. Right over there. The first door on your left. Thank you. You fool! Why didn't you tell them? They didn't ask me anything about it. I asked oh. them. Uh, I did this uh, Academy Award uh, given to Senate. Frank Capra is on the right. Right. Honorary and Honorary award uh, to a great genius of and, uh, the silent that, film. That, that uh, Max Senate came to see W.C. Fields here in the Ziegfeld Follies. And so he saw all these things on stage, although they never worked together in New York. They did hook up again in Hollywood, and that's when they did these Max Sennett shorts. And in 1938, Max Sennett received the Honorary Academy Award, and he asked that W.C. Fields, his good friend, present it to him. And uh, I love that photo. It's very, to me, it's very, very touching. Uh, he took, well, as I've been mentioning all night, he took a lot of his movies, put a lot of his stage routines right into his films because they were tried and true. He had the audience. Chaplin was making silent films, and Keaton was making silent films, but W.C. was here in the theaters around then, happening at uh, Times Square, in front of live audience, honing his routines down to the best possible um, skits. And one of the, and it's a gift we talked about earlier as being one of his arguably best, funniest films, but when, one of the, Things that he brought to the stage, I mean to the films, from the stage was this next clip from It's a Gift. And it's not the directly bringing it, it's the soul of what he was. And the soul of what he was was basically uh, head of a dysfunctional family and a businessman who did business badly. <laughs> and he put those concepts together and made this delightful film with uh, all sorts of stuff, with W.C. being hilarious and being very human. So if you can see the... Oh, and Harry, do you have something to say about the scene coming yeah. up? Why are we included? We're going into Mr. 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 Muckle. Yeah. Yes, we are showing Mr. Muckle because at our famous lunch two months ago uh -huh. in New York, yeah. 
I, I went, I d went over the program that we were planning for this evening with Mr. Cabot, and he said it sounds fine and comprehensive, but he said, you can't have any program with W.C. Fields without including Mr. Muckle. So Mr. Cabot, this uh, is our gift to you. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you. How about my kumquats? Yeah. Coming, coming. I'm in a hurry. Coming, 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 coming. Now, uh, what was that you wanted? Kumquats. Oh, uh, kumquats, yes. Yeah. Ten pounds of kumquats. <laughs> Open the door for Mr. Buckle. What? Open the door for Mr. Buckle, the blind man. How about my kumquats? What'd you say? Kumquats. Wait. You got that door closed again, huh? I, I'm awfully sorry, I'm awfully sorry. Come on, this What's way. What's that? Don't, don't do Wait, that. Wait, look out! What's that? What's that? It's all right. Think nothing of it, just a little glassware. What? Just a little glassware. What's the matter with you? Can't here, you talk? Here's your pipe, here. Here, here you are right here. Come on. Oh, what'd right. you say? I said it was nothing but just a little glassware. Uh, what are you doing right. there for? Come, Come on. It's all right. Put it in there. And uh, now, uh, what can I do? Uh, what can I do for you? Have we got any chewing gum? Uh, yes, we have. Uh, yes, we have. Yes, yes, we have. How about my kumquats? Coming, 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 coming. Now you just, just now you sit right here till I come back. I'll bring you right back to you. Sit right there. <laughs> Please sit there like you got. Have those kumquats in a minute. I wonder what kind of gum he wants. I guess that. Sit down, Mr. Muckle. Sit down, sit down. Sit down, sit down Mr. Muckle. Sit down. Hold me a second now. Sit down. Sit down, Mr. Muckle, honey. Sit down. Oh, that's broke. I'll get it fixed. I'll be right with you. Don't go away. Come here, huh? Sit down, Mr. Muckle. Sit down, honey. <laughs> Come quats. Come on, now you'll get the gum cut for the quats now. Yeah. <laughs> will you sit? Will you mind telling Mr. Muckle? Never mind. I'll, I'll tell him it's all right. Sit down, Mr. Muckle, please. Yeah. I'm polite to them. Sit down. <laughs> Put it down, Mr. Muckle. Put it down, honey. Put it down, please. <laughs> there was another one. <laughs> Mr. Muckle, please sit down. Please. <laughs> I want kumquats. Come in, come in. Oh. Got the chewing gun. Where's my gun? Sit down, Mr. Buckle! Sit down! 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 Sit Here's your chewing gun. Five cents, please. Yeah, I'm not gonna lug that with me. Send it. <laughs> hey, <run. coughs> hey, run. Take this over to Mr. Muckle's house. Jump on your bicycle and run right away. Hurry up. Now you're all... No, 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 not that way. Not that way. Here we are. Here, here. That's it. How about my kumquat? Oh, excuse me. Yes. How does he rate all his attention? Who is that man? It's a house detective over at the Grand Hotel. <laughs> The great critic Kenneth Tynan in his unmissable piece about fields in his book Show People, um, in which he points out the genius of not just saying Mr. Buckle, but Mr. Buckle, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and it parallels in the great scene of the back porch when he tries to go to sleep and it's a gift, and the loud, 
vegetable man is shouting and disappears underneath, as I recall it, yes. Mr. Fields exits, re-enters with a shotgun, lays it on the banister and says, vegetable man, <laughs> vegetable gentleman. <laughs> Were those written because, I think this is important, uh, old Mr. Paul Jones in his dusty old Fairmount office had pricelessly on a shelf about ten of your granddad's scripts, um, along with the great McGinty and a couple other movies he produced. But I took one of Mr. Field's scripts and about seven places when I would open it, there would be a line of dialogue, another line of dialogue from another actor, and then it would say, Mr. Fields inserts appropriate dialogue or business at this point. And I just wondered, has anybody ever taken It's a Gift and the others and checked those cues and what actually was inserted there? The great project. Yeah. Well, you know, Mr. Cameron, we, uh we inherited all of W.C.'s artifacts and memorabilia, and yeah. including his scripts where he would pencil in. Pencil in. And they're all in the W.C. Fields collection at the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences, Margaret Herrick Library, where we mm. placed them. Because we, all, we knew all along they didn't belong to us. They belonged to the world. So oh, yeah. many of them are there. Oh, I'd love to so see. So next time you're there, you stop there and stop at the Magic Castle. Can I use your name? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, won't, I won't do you any good, but you can use it. <laughs> and I'll bet you anything, Mr. Muckle Honey is not in the screen. <laughs> no, I mean it shows the sweetness and gentleness. Should we move into a little? Yeah, we have, we have time for a little Q and A. If some folks would like to ask some questions, it would be a perfect opportunity to do it. Well, incidentally, that back porch scene is on YouTube. Oh, is it? And if you ever have a case of the blues, it will cure them. Ah, we were going to show it here, but we didn't have the time. We, no. we had to cut it out, unfortunately. Uh, I, uh, well, you have to see, the next time you can see it is in early October at the Museum of the Moving Image. Yep, yeah, true. With a 250-seat auditorium. Mm -hmm. So, uh, this, this is for, for you, Mr. Kevin. So, it's, it, it's interesting that W.C. Fields seemed to become a sort of a countercultural icon during the 1960s. Can you talk a little bit about that? He was, yes. I, I was alive in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you'd be a No, barely. But, I don't um, remember it, but I was alive. He and the Marx Brothers became heroes in their way. Groucho always disavowed the nonsense of the idea of their being uh, cultural and political critics. He said, we were just trying to be funny. Um, but uh, they were, they were, they were a adopted, and um, hippies, Richard Nixon's favorite word, um, <laughs> bastard, uh, would, uh, would, would go, no, my dear, I never did, or whatever, they were, would do fields at times, they really admired, and his poster would be on the walls of communes, I shouldn't think, I shouldn't be surprised, but, oh, yeah. The question. Yes. Did W. C. Fields have any favorite comedians of his own? Well, you know, he uh, he was really self-educated, and we inherited. Uh, he he read all of Dickens, all of Mark Twain, and when he was touring the world, he would get uh, half trunks, and he would go into the local library, and he said, "What should a fellow like me know?" And you know, what books. should I learn? What should I read? Mm -hmm. So he would fill the, the trunks of books. And then when he would perform throughout the world, it was almost like a book club. And so after the performance, he was so good with his cast. I mean, he really created a, a community sense with them. They would almost, they would read a book, and then they would discuss what they were reading, all from W.C. Field's trunk. So to answer your question, it was the greats. Yeah. You know, it, it, it was the greats, Dickens, and that's why I think it was Graham, Graham Breen who said uh, W.C. was... The Dickens. That he was equal to Dixie. Dickens' yes. character and, and was a genius, macabre, as we know. Oh. Uh, has anybody ever done a little feuilleton or piece about uh, the allusions, not illusions, in, in the films? He will do a line from Dickens, doesn't identify it, um, or, or a phrase, or a hilariously feels the pronounced. French phrase as when he goes to the hot dog man at the circus thing and says, 
I should like to partake of your viands. <laughs> <laughs> or foie gras. You know what that is, don't you? Yeah, oh, yeah. Puss's liver. Right? Yeah. Countess de Pussy. How do you get that past the same? <laughs> <laughs> Her name was de Pussy. Yes. Yeah. But let that pass. What year did he die? He died on Christmas Day, 1946. It's interesting, Christmas Day. God, I could have met him. <laughs> yes, all, all he'd need is a 10-year-old kid by his bedside. Uh, <laughs> uh, I have a quick question to the panel, the Fields family and Mr. Cabot. Fields is great, we love him. What about, could you tell us a little about one of Fields' great friends? One of the great pictures of W.C. Fields is him in profile with John Barrymore. Can you tell us something about their friendship? Barry Warren Fields. I, I could Brian deal did. with that a bit. They, they were the best of friends. And, mm -hmm. and during the World War, Barrymore was, during the beginning of the World War, end of the 30s, uh, beginning of the 40s, and, and Barrymore was in the room with WC, and WC was noted to have bank accounts throughout the world. And so Barrymore says, hey, Uncle Bill, you have a bank account in Berlin, and aren't you worried about your money? And W.C. goes, no, what if the son of a bitch wins? <laughs> they, they were the greatest friends. They used to go up to Bundy Boulevard to John Decker's house. John Decker was a painter. And until just recently, the last 10 years, he was such a good forger that Harvard, the Harvard Art Museum, I forgot the name now, but the Harvard Art Museum had a Rembrandt I don't know, Rembrandt, hanging on their wall, and it was John Decker's. <laughs> and they recently found it out. Uh, but that was a group, they called it the Bundy Bunch, and it was Decker, Sadakichi Hartman, a very strange fellow, half Japanese, half German during World War II, not too popular with the, the entire population. Uh, <laughs> and John Decker, uh, Gene Fowler, the great writer, he was friends with them and wrote the great book, uh, Minutes of the Last Meeting. Uh, it's a, it's a, just a great writing, not an exceptionally good story, but a wonderful biography of Sadakichi Hartman, but truly the story of this Bundy Bunch, these great talents that got together yeah, on Bundy Boulevard. Yes? Yeah, uh, the film critic and historian, William, this question is directed to you. The film critic and historian, William K. Everson, so that one of the things that made Fields unique was that most comedians do their best work early in their career, whereas Fields made perhaps his greatest from the bank at the tail end of his career. So I was wondering if you agree with that statement and if you have any stories about the bank and the writing of the film. Well, W.C. was obsessed with drugstores. Now, this sounds like it has nothing to do with the bank tip. He did the pharmacist. He did the, he, he, it's, it's a gift. It's, you know, he's a drug. He says in the bank tip, I, I don't know why this popped in my head. He says in the bank tip when he's trying to convince the uh, bank examiner not to look at the book, Lombok's well, a great town. I'll give you a tour. He says, we actually have three drugstores in here in this town, and one of them actually sells drugs. <laughs> As you can, I don't need to tell you, but I do the worst impersonation. Um, <laughs> you may discover that. Um, the Bank Tick was a, I don't know, it's a great, uh, one of the great movies. I think it's a gift, The Bank Tick. It's really, it's hard to say which is the best, I think. Um, but yeah, he did. And he did, it, uh, did most of his good work. I mean, like uh, Louise Brooks says that three of the, the uh, Edward Eddie Sutherland directed him in three books, Louise Brooks' husband. And he says that these movies are lost, the ones he did with Edward uh, uh, Cochran. He says, and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> he said, those silent films are nothing. But he did develop his, his whole routine on stage in front of a live audience. It have been hammering all night. And, and I, think the bank, I think that's why he comes at the end of his career. His first talking film is when he's 50 years old. Um, in 54, when he saw that, that juggling routine, he was 54 years old. This is, and he still was you know, moving like that. So, I, you know, he never stopped. And I have a book called Life on Film. And Arthur's book, which is fabulous, I'm in the middle of right now, is called From uh, uh, Burlesque to Vaudeville to Broadway, I believe. And, uh, and he corrects me in everything, so I ask him. <laughs> 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 but 
But I, I wrote mine a little earlier than he did. <laughs> you left all those papers. You know. Yeah, and the, all the papers I said I went through and I didn't. <laughs> no, I did. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I, I can't say why necessarily. Maybe you can help me. But his best work came afterwards. And the reason why I mentioned my book, Life on Film, is because he took everything personally. He took life personally. When you see Kathleen Howard playing his wife on film, that's my grandmother. That's Hattie. That's how she was. She was pompous. She was <laughs> blaming him for everything. Um, and, and the son, he always has a sissy son. And one of, he thought my father was, was a sissy because he was a mother's boy. And it was true, he was. He was raised by the mother. And so he actually has, in one of his movies, his son is named, my father went by the name W. Claude Fields Jr., not W.C. Fields Jr. And so one of his sons, or stepsons actually, in one of his movies is Grady Sutton, whose name is Claude in the movie. I mean, they're just, it's clear he's depicting his family on every one of these movies, or what he conceives of his family. I think the first time I almost left my tonsils out was the first time I saw the bank dick. He meets Grady Sutton, asks his name. Yeah. <laughs> Shall I go on with this? Yeah. And says, uh, my name is Og Ogilby. He says, Og Ogilby, eh? <laughs> Sounds like a bubble in the bathtub. <laughs> and the other, the, other great, the other great line is Og turns to WC convinced Og to embezzle money from the bank. And now the bank examiner shows up. So Og is so mad as his future father-in-law, which is WC, he goes to him, I was a perfect fool to listen to you. And he goes, listen, Og, there's nothing in this world that's perfect. <laughs> What's the yes. Oh. Uh, Mr. Cat mentioned the Marx Brothers. Ron, you told a very funny story about the WC following the Marx Brothers. Uh, oh, no, I must have been drunk at the time. <laughs> <laughs> you said you couldn't follow the Marx Brothers when they were in Portville. Yeah. So you said you had Oxus or the Monoxus or, or Mogo and the Magogo oh, and Mogo, the engagement. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Mogo and the Magogo, which he also uses the bank deck, and I never remember telling that story. But <laughs> I don't remember last night. <laughs> Just a few more questions. Yes. Mae West, how many films with one. Mae West? I got a great story about Mae West. They only did one, My Little Chickadee, although they always connect them. Here's a story. When I was, when I was during the 70s, when I was promoting my first book, a producer says to me, he says, listen, would you, I know you're promoting your book, would you mind going on with Mae West? And I said, no, I would love it. And right before the show went on, I got the best interview with Mae West I ever had through the producer. I said, Mae West wasn't there, and I said, sir, do you expect Mae West to be here soon? And he goes, no one would ask her if she'd go on with you. She said she didn't want to meet another Fields as long as she lived. <laughs> <laughs> True story. <laughs> you just kicked in my memory again. I did a special with Mae West. And I talked to her on the phone a couple times, and I thought, I don't want to lose these for posterity, and I illegally taped reel-to-reel -reel on an old woolen sack about a half hour with Mae West, and it includes, I didn't bring the subject of him up, you know, Bill Fields would go in at night, and a, one of my friends at the studio told me this, and he cut out my best takes. He, he paid them to cut out my best takes in my little chickadee. The old bag. I mean, <laughs> of course he didn't. Did I he? know, yeah. <laughs> oh. But she was a little paranoid. <laughs> and there was a great moment with her. She was older than you know whom. <laughs> And she had this hat, and the great Edith Head costumed her for this special. It's called Dick Cavett's Backlot USA or something. Um, and I went into rehearsal, and there she was with the, the hat and the beautiful hair. And the director said over the talk back, uh, could you take the hat off for just a moment? And I'm watching the monitor, and Edith Head's 
head <laughs> leans into the picture and says, the hat does not come off. <laughs> Obviously, half of her face would have gone with it. it <laughs> yes, and one last question over there. I read the book W.C. Fields and Me when it came out, and it was like a definitive biography <laughs> at the time. Obviously, there's been a lot more since. That was but the only living actor I know who worked with him is Professor Irwin Corey, who introduced to me that book. Is there any other person alive today who worked with W.C. Field? I don't think Aaron Curry, Corey worked with W.C. And by the way, you're right about W.C. and me as being a definitive biography. It was a definitive biography of Carlotta Monti, not <laughs> W.C. What's the least good biography? Pardon me? What's the worst biography? <laughs> One of the best read and worst factual biography was um, Robert Lewis Taylor. Robert Lewis Taylor. Robert Lewis Taylor. Uh -huh. And it's one, he's a wonderful writer, but yeah. just, uh, just made up stories. <laughs> <laughs> and we're we're Jean, back to Nixon again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gene Fowler was asked to write the W.C. Field biography, the definitive one, and he's just so emotional, he says, I can't handle it. You know, he wrote Good Night, Sweet Prince of John Barrymore, and they were all friends, but he couldn't do the field thing. Gloria Jean is still alive, and so is the girl who played his uh, foil in Sensations in 1945. They're both still living. And so is Rose Marie. Yes. Yes. Gloria Jean is alive. Jean, Gloria Jean, Gloria Jean, Gloria Jean, it's a gift. It's still alive. Yes. The daughter. Oh, uh, what's her name? Jean. Jean Rubinow, we met her. Yes. What's the exact length of the back porch scene if we were lucky enough to have seen it? Yeah. That baby has to be right. Is that about five minutes or ten minutes long? I can't remember. Just With that little baby? The back porch. Oh, the back. Oh, no, that's about. What was that? You and Eric, you would know. It's eight minutes and 49 seconds. <laughs> I want to thank Eric Grayson and his. Come Let's back. skip dinner and see it. Uh, I'd like to thank I'd like to thank you all for coming. I'd like to you know any more. I'd like to thank, I'd like to thank Mr. Cavanagh especially. Thank you so much. Time for a Gillis book. I'm doing this completely off script because I want to do one final plug. We, I have completed the libretto for W.C. Fields musical. We already have the music done, the composition done, and if anyone has the money to put it up. In the <laughs> we uh, already had an equity workshop that went fabulously well, actually. It went really well. So we're. we're I'm, I'm going to play W.C. I will. No, I can't. <laughs> How um, many of his costumes and clothes survive? Quite a bit. We have a lot of his canes. His, yeah. his, this is uh, his uh, golf clubs. Yeah. We've got the canes from Poppy. We've got the hat, the glasses from Dickens. Ah. Uh, yeah. I took that around on one of my <laughs> book tours and lost one of the lenses. <laughs> then I slipped it back where it was and didn't tell anyone. <laughs> Um, is that really his pool cue at the Players Club? At the Magic Castle, we have one. Uh, I don't know about the Players Club. Yeah, there's one over there. Is that right? the fireplace in the it's bar. Right. No, we have the complete pool table. I'll tell a lie. It's yeah. Mark Twain's cue. Is it? No. Yeah, yeah. But the, the one in California is real. It's Magic Castle. is the pool table we had in the basement of my grandmother's apartment in Beverly Hills. And they had the pool cues there, too. We didn't know that. I didn't, Harriet had to tell me W.C. was my grandfather. Oh. <laughs> and that was just a few hours ago. <laughs> I, uh, no, I was about 12 years old. I'm watching W.C. have to run out of the room. It's just like, yeah. And I had to get out of the room or there would be a flood and I'd die because I couldn't breathe. And Harriet came down very concerned. She goes, are you okay? Are you okay? I said, yeah. I said, that guy up there's got to be the funniest guy who ever lived. And she goes, you don't know, do you? 
I don't know what. He's your grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I don't know wonder I have so many friends. <laughs> <laughs> well, we want to thank you all for coming. Gary, but thank you so much. First of all, I want, on your way out, please stop in front of the photo of W.C. Fields and say thank you. <laughs> thank you for your gift to the world, and I thank you, Grandfather. Thank you all. Thank you all.